डेट ऑन श्री राम कृष्णा एंड प्रे फॉर वेल बींग ऑफ द होल ह्यूमैनिटी शांत शांत शांति हरिओम तापकाय धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे तापकाय धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठा राम कृष्णा ते नम हसतो मदगमय तमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मृतंगमय ओ शांति 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 लेट एस बो डाउन टू श्री राम कृष्ण द एम्बॉडिमेंट ऑफ ऑल रिलीजन्स the supreme god incarnate let us pray to him to lead us from the unreal to the real to lead us from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge to lead us from death to immortality in the last class we have started the topic vedanta the light of knowledge and it is very important to know that in order to dispel darkness you have to bring the light vedanta is the light as long as people are deeply involved in worldly things worldly matters worldly activities worldly ways they are totally in darkness as long as they are in darkness they cannot overcome suffering so they can't have real joy in the life as long as they are in darkness that means as long as the mind is dipped in worldliness totally dipped it has become like a wet matchstick strike it any number of time it won't you won't get the light because as long as the wetness is there as long as the moisture is there matchstick will not strike in the same way the mind has acquired that moisture of worldliness so much it has become too much wet so it's impossible to think of spiritual ideas as long as the mind is totally dipped in worldliness so the first awakening is that you should know where the problem is first you must know it without knowing the problem you can't simply take the treatment it's a waste if you know the problem correctly then the solution is there it's very very clear very clear and the mahatmas come to show the solution to point out the problems and to give remedies that's the function of the guru what does he do he just gives an awakening to the disciple and he makes the disciple struggle to get over worldliness as long as one is worldly he will have no taste of god and even if he talks about god it is simply a, a fashionable way of telling shri ram krishna himself tells in the gospel uh, a person who is very worldly and he would say oh oh god has created this wonderful garden oh god has created this wonderful flower that's all so as long as the mind runs after the sensuous pleasures so long one has to remain in ignorance and it is really too terrible for a person to raise himself from that horrible 
condition. So, that's why we insist upon to be in touch with holy people who speak about spiritual ideas, who discuss about the spiritual matters, who really kindle the light of knowledge, who alone have that power of drying up the wetness of the mind, drying up the moisture of the mind. So cleansing of mind is a very important factor. Then the light of knowledge shines wonderfully, beautifully, well. Once you see that shining of light, you will be in ecstasy. So, for most of the people, this world is the reality. As long as you hold on to this idea, you will never have spiritual light. We fail to realize that what we consider the world is only an abstract of reality and not reality itself. It is like a two-dimensional projection of a multi-dimensional entity. To take Sri Ramakrishna's simile, it is like the apprehension of the elephant by the blind men. One blind man touches the leg of the animal and thinks that the elephant is a pillar. Another one feels its ear, takes it for an enormous fan. There are six blind people. They contact six different parts of the elephant and give six disparate definitions of the elephant. But the real elephant is something totally transcending all these conceptions. Reality is beyond all the fragmentary apprehensions of it, received by us through the senses and the mind. Whatever you perceive through the senses and the mind, it's fragmentary. After all, these instruments of knowledge are woefully limited in their grasp and range. All their reports have to be accepted with a wide margin of reservation. Indeed, real knowledge consists in knowing the limitations of the instruments of knowledge. There is a story, it said that some friends excited hearing some pleasant news, they came to Socrates to inform him that the oracle of Delphi had declared that the wisest man living was Socrates. What was the reaction of Socrates? He was a great scholar, no doubt, great philosopher. But philosopher in the real sense of the term, not a fake one, not a fake one. That's why he is remarkably great. And his reaction was, he just smiled and replied, Well, Perhaps the oracle means that I know that I do not know. Understanding the parameters of knowledge is true enlightenment. To know reality, what you should do? Know thyself. Understand the mind with which we try to understand the world. After all, in the final analysis, everything depends on the mind. How oh, mind is very important, extremely important, not simply important, extremely. But 
we are not giving any attention for training the mind. That's the sorry, sad part of it, I should say. Maneva manushyanam karanam bandha moksha yoho. How the Upanishads very beautifully explain the whole phenomena. Why there is suffering? Because of the mind. Mind. Happiness and unhappiness, both are an account of the mind. All happiness and unhappiness are mental products. We are cognizant only of ideas. It is these ideas that make us happy or miserable. A famous uh, philosopher Kant says, we can never know reality as such. The thing itself is beyond the pale of the human mind. So, what we call knowledge is only what the mind is able to report. The mind, therefore, has to be examined. But this is not an invitation to plunge into psychoanalysis. That would be like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. The Freudians say, that all our troubles are due to suppressed thoughts and desires. Certain ideas and feelings are considered taboo by that part of the conscious which is termed the censor. These vetoed concepts and emotions sink into the unconscious and there like the fallen angels in Milton's Paradise Lost, they abide their time to avenge themselves. Underground, they form gangs called complexes and start secretly influencing and directing the conscious mind. A slip of the tongue, for instance, is not just an accident. It is but a clever surfacing of a suppressed thought hiding in the unconscious. A spurt of anger or violence is only the opportune upsurge of an outlawed desire. Hence, the psychoanalyst technique is to expose the unconscious to the conscious. He encourages the patient to recall to memory various incidents of the past so that the latent thoughts, feelings and cravings may come up and provide clues to otherwise inexplicable actions. The reasoning is that once you know the underlying cause of a trouble, you can eliminate it through discrimination. To illustrate from a case history, there was a doctor who had just taken his degree and uh, set up practice. He was having daily nightmares that he was being harassed by the income tax authorities. Now it is said that dreams are wish fulfillments. What we are unable to do or enjoy during the waking hours, we compensate by doing and enjoying in the dream. But then, being harassed cannot be a wish fulfillment. So the doctor consulted a psychoanalysis. After a lot of probing, the young man admitted that he had great ambitions and he was eagerly looking forward to making money. Now in the dream he was putting himself in a position of such affluence that the attention of the income tax authorities was being drawn to him. The harassment may not be pleasant, but the situation that had in initiated the harassment was certainly desirable to the dreamer. So far, so good, but it is not much good. Psychoanalytical interpretation bristles with difficulties. Many of the complexes latent in the unconscious emerge heavily disguised. It is not easy to pray off their masks. 
the psychoanalyst's verdict is often the gambler's throw. He gives us a plausible interpretation and trusts to luck. It is a patient who suffers. A mistaken interpretation may lead to disaster. In fact, psychoanalysis is able to tackle only superficial problems. That's all. It cannot deal with causes deeper down. The unconscious of an unimaginable depth and what all ma monsters are lurking there defy imagination. Also, some of these suppressed desires, when accidentally hit upon, retaliate force fiercely. They are like a wounded tiger, which is much more dangerous than an unwounded one. It is fashionable to compare psychoanalytical therapy to cleaning a well. They give this example. It is pointed out that when a well is being cleaned, a lot of muck comes up and the water turns dirtier than before when you are cleaning. But after all the muddy water has been bailed out, the fresh water is pellucid, is very clear. The simile overlooks the fact that unlike the well, the mind cannot take a holiday. We may refrain from using the well for a couple of days to give it time to recoup itself. But our mind has to be actively working every minute of the 24 hours. With a muddy mind, the results are bound to be muddy. Also, it must be remembered that the unconscious does not lend itself so quietly to bailing out. As the Upanishads put it, it is more like trying to empty the ocean with a blade of grass. In fine, the remedy of psychoanalysis succeeds only in aggravating the malady. It has become quite fashionable today and is considered a status symbol. But the only one who profits by it seems to be the psychoanalyst. So, what I wanted to point out is that this psychoanalyst cannot tackle the mind, cannot remove all the dirt of the mind. Their treatment is only extremely superficial. And there are many people who are under the psychiatric treatment, always under sedation. What kind of life it is? No doubt it helps in an extremely uh, initial stage when the mind has not been totally uh, sick, but then psychoanalyst is not the solution to deal with the problems of mind. Our scriptures provide us better and safer solution. How? In what manner? We will take it up in the next Tuesday class. Page 634. Vijay said humbly to the Master, Sir, please give me permission. Only then will I sit on the platform. Master said with a smile, What shall I say? Pray to God yourself. He belongs to all. Even as Uncle Moon is the uncle of all children. You have nothing to fear if you are sincere. On being further requested by Vijay, the Master said, Yes, go. Follow the rules. Everything is alright if one has sincere love for God. Vijay sat on their platform and conducted the worship according to the rules of the Brahma Samaj. At the time for prayer, he repeatedly called on their mother, touching the hear hearts of all. After the worship, their host entertained the master and the devotees with a sumptuous feast. Soon they were ready to return home. Sri Ramakrishna became engaged in conversation with Vijay, no one else but Yam being present. Master said, You prayed to God, addressing him as mother. That's very good. People say that the mother's attachment to the child is strongest than the father's. A son can force his demand on his mother, but not on his father. Once cartloads of money 
were coming from the estate of Trilokia's mother. They were guarded by many red turbaned stalwarts armed with big sticks. Trilokia, who had been waiting on the road with his men, pounced upon the money and took it away by force. A son has a very strong claim on his mother's wealth. People say that a mother cannot very well sue her son in the court of law. But in America they do. <laughs> Even in India also they do modern times. It is during Sri Ramakrishna's time. It's all true. Vijay said, If Brahman is our mother, then has it any form or is it formless? Then Master replied, That which is Brahman is also Kali, the mother, the primal energy. When inactive, it's called Brahman. Again, when creating, preserving and destroying, it is called Shakti. Still, water is an illustration of Brahman. Still water is an illustration of Brahman. The same water, moving in waves, may be compared to Shakti, Kali. What's the meaning of Kali? She who communes with Mahakala, the Absolute, is Kali. What is the meaning of Kali? She who communes with Mahakala, the Absolute, is Kali. She is formless and again she has forms. If you believe in the formless aspect, then meditate on Kali as that. If you meditate on any aspect of her with firm conviction, she will let you know her true nature. Then you will realize that not merely does God exist, but he will come near you and talk to you as I am talking to you. Have faith and you will achieve everything. Remember this too. If you believe that God is formless, then stick to that belief with firm conviction. But don't be dogmatic. Never say emphatically about God. Never say emphatically about God that He can be only this and not that. You may say, I believe that God is formless, but He can be many things more. He alone knows what else He can be. I do not know, I do not understand. How can man with his one ounce of intelligence know the real nature of God? Can you put four shares of milk in a one share jar? If God, through his grace, ever reveals himself to his devotee and makes him understand, then he will know, but not otherwise. We shall stop here. So, we have to light up the knowledge, knowledge is the light. That's the way to dispel the darkness. See, the knowledge, the light, once you see that light, you are in ecstasy. And to taste that ecstasy, you cherish devotion, bhakti. So to taste knowledge, to taste jnana, you must have bhakti. So, bhakti is very, very much needed to experience, to taste, to feel the joy of seeing God, the joy of knowing truth, the joy of knowing thyself. So bhakti and jnana, they, they are inseparable. Why, when you see God, you went into, you go into ecstasy and shed tears, the tears of joy are the expression of love towards God. And that love is because of devotion. That's how bhakti is connected. The other way is also true. Once you, that knowledge is awakened, once you know that God is the only real thing and God is the goal whom I have to reach, then with that knowledge firmly established in your mind, you pursue it and reach it. When you reach it, you will be shedding tears of joy. That is, your knowledge culminates in bhakti, devotion. See, so which is superior, which is... Uh, subsidiary, which is secondary. Both of them are primary. One and upwards and reverse of the same coin. Knowledge on one side, devotion on the other side. But then the karma is their action. Karma is generally the struggle. The struggle to reach the goal. That is generally defined as karma. You are struggling to meditate upon. You are struggling to concentrate the mind. You are struggling to cleanse the mind. You are struggling to, struggling to get over the darkness of ignorance. All these come under the realm of karma, action. 
you are trying to destroy the evil forces by resorting to good forces you are you are struggling to give a good fight to the evil forces and this process of constant fight is under the realm of action karma and meditation is nothing but concentration of the mind which helps you to come very close to god to come very close to the light of knowledge once you have come the the purpose of meditation is over and once you are in that shining soothing blissful light you enjoy immensely perpetual joy you are tasting the love of god you are tasting the experience that is when the knowledge is finally awakened you are full with devotion but when you use the devotion as the means to realize god then at the culmination of devotion you become ecstatic by the knowledge by the by, by the revelation you see god re- revealing to you and that's the beauty of that so there need not be any conflict between knowledge and bhakti and both are required both are important both are useful both are helpful both make us our happiness more solid and permanent either way is all right you can use knowledge as a means but finally it ends up in bhakti but you can use bhakti as a means you end up in knowledge bhakti is required to taste it you require the tongue to taste the sweets <laughs> so devotion is the tongue tasting how nice it is without devotion what's your it's not they say dry knowledge intellectualism dry knowledge is compared to the dry scholarship of the pandits <laughs> who have not realized the truth but the real knowledge is a person who has real knowledge oh he is so beautiful because he he manifests that quality of knowledge through devotion through love he loves everyone that when once you love it you are coming under the realm of bhakti that's the beauty that's the beauty of the well but anyway we have to struggle by struggling only you get not simply let me do it afterwards it will never happen if you if you say i will do afterwards you will never be able to do it that afterwards will drag you towards the end not only that it will drag you towards your next life also when you are born next time again you will drag afterwards afterwards when the more you drag on the more difficult for you to rise up yourself that means you are allowing the mind to become more and more wet it it absorbs more and more moisture it becomes heavy heavy like uh, the snow accumulated so snow it becomes ice how terrible it is even the sun cannot melt the ice it becomes so heavy and solid how difficult it is to break the ice stronger than the stone stronger than the rock like that mind also it becomes worse and worse but the more the mind becomes worse the more you will suffer that's the point so why don't you why do you allow your mind to that state never allow it that means you have to struggle struggle once that you know the truth immediately you start up doing things never say afterwards in spiritual life afterwards has no meaning afterwards has no meaning in spiritual life this moment today this moment that's important do that sincerely positively that will take care of everything that's the way thank you very much chant the name of the lord and his glory unceasingly that the mirror of the heart may be wiped clean and quench that mighty forest fire worldly lust raging furiously within o name stream down in moonlight on the lotus heart opening its cup to knowledge of thyself o self drown deep in the waves of his bliss tasting his nectar at every step bathing in his name that bound our weary souls various are thy names o lord in each and every name thy power resides no times are rest no times are set no rites are needful for chanting of thy name so vast is thy mercy how huge then is my wretchedness who find in this empty life and heart no devotion to thy name o my mind be humbler than a blade of grass be patient and forbearing like a tree take no honor to thyself give honor to all chant unceasingly the name of the lord o lord and soul of the universe 
mind is no prayer for wealth or retinue the playthings of lust or the toys of fame as many times as i may be reborn grant me o lord a steadfast love for thee a drowning man in this world's fearful ocean is thy servant o sweet one in thy mercy consider me as dust beneath thy feet o oh, how i long for the day when an instant separation from thee o lord will be as a thousand years for my heart burns with this desire and the world without thee is a heartless void prostrate at thy feet let me be in unwavering devotion neither imploring the embrace of thy arms nor bewailing the withdrawal of thy presence though it tears my soul asunder o thou who still as the hearts of thy devotees do with me what thou wilt for thou art my heart's beloved thou and thou alone o lord lead us from the unreal to the real lead us from darkness to light and lead us from death to immortality may all be free from dangers may all realize what is good may all be actuated by noble thoughts may all rejoice everywhere may all be happy may all be free from disease may all realize what is good may none be subject to misery may the wicked become virtuous may the virtuous attain tranquility may the tranquil be free from bonds may the freed make others free may good be tied all people may the sovereign righteously rule the earth may all beings ever attain what is good may the whole may the worlds be prosperous and happy may the clouds pour rain in time may the earth be blessed with crops may all countries be free from calamity may holy men live without fear may the lord the destroyer of sins the presiding deity of all sacred works be satisfied for he being pleased the whole universe becomes pleased he being satisfied the whole universe feels satisfied